with that, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see what we got. Y'all ready? Y'all ready for this? All right. Mr. Tom, please start this, somebody said. All right, so it's that time, ladies and gentlemen. Hey there, students. We have got another, uh, you know, yet another Euro season about to wrap up. And it is the night before Euro, and it is time for that review. All right, so let's go ahead and get in here. And, you know, we've got a few uh, a few pog champs in the chat there. Jason, that was a totally pog move, complimenting the mug. I love it. I love it. Okay. And so with that, uh, we've got uh, some compliments for the mug, and I'm going to be getting to questions really uh, quick like now, but we need to hear a few words from our sponsors, okay? So first of all, let's make sure that, uh, you know, so Romulus... Um, Euro. Um, of course, my Romulus Euro app is available at the App Store and Google Play, ladies and gentlemen. So let me just go ahead and remind y'all. It's just a little trivia app, $2.99. I mean, I'm not working miracles. I'm not uh, curing leprosy uh, or anything like that or walking on water. But, you know, it is something. Now, forget that thing that it says about the American Revolution. I don't know where that came from. Uh, but it is actually about, uh, you know, about AP Euro. So you can pick whatever topic, you know, you're thinking about okay what if what am i you know week on it'll give you some trivia questions it's got hundreds of questions in there for 2.99 it can't be beat of course pov me all right now also remember if you go to marcolearning.com you're going to see a few things there uh, now with that excuse me you're going to get some free ap resources oh my goodness study guides lesson plans review videos um, oh my goodness! Well, I'm not. Well, I'm an AP teacher, but y'all aren't. So, uh, so study guides. You can go uh, get some free AP study guides here. History guides. You can get a whole set of AP European History study guide pack. You want to do one last, uh, you know, one last practice test. Marco Learning has got you covered. History practice test. Look at that AP to the Euro with answer explanations. Now, also we can type this in, but MarcoLearning.com slash AP Euro. Okay. And if you go there, you're actually going to find some things, uh, some study guides that I had a hand in putting together. So that's something, you know, marcolearning.com slash AP Euro. So remember that. And of course, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, Romulus Euro is available at the App Store and Google Play for $2.99. And uh, that's just a little app that I made. And then, ladies and gentlemen, at 10 o'clock tonight, the art of euro okay now those of you on youtube if you just look in the description there is a link to register for this premium hangout it's just uh ten dollars uh to get in and so we are going to be going over art movements from the renaissance to the baroque on um, to uh you know to neoclassicism romanticism uh, then going into impressionism expressionism dada i'm going to be giving out some instagram shout outs uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, um, so some Instagram shout outs. Uh, so make sure, uh, you know, go and like the most recent one. If you don't know about uh, this, if you don't know what this is, you might want to sign up for the art review. OK, so I will be doing some Instagram uh, shout outs and also a shout out to Jay, who is there in the chat. Uh, so they're actually real, uh, you know, real people. Um, so. Uh, all right. So. Uh, OK, so. Uh, Okay, so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, so with that, we've heard a word from our sponsors, Romulus Euro, Marco Learning. We've got the Art of Euro coming up later at 10 o'clock tonight. And so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get to some questions. Looks like we got like 50 questions waiting on us. Can we go over the revolutions of 1848? Um, of course, we can go over the revolutions of 1848, ladies and gentlemen. And in fact, on YouTube, I've got a five part uh, lecture on the revolutions of 1848. So that's definitely something y'all want to uh, y'all want to think about. Now, let's get out of a push that is over for the year or at least uh, the paper pencil part is. And let's go ahead and where are we going? 
AP Euro. All right. So let's uh, let's get over there and let's see. So we've got a question about the revolutions of 1848. Now, contextualization, ladies and gentlemen, we want to think about the conservative order. OK, so this is really the halfway point in this course is the fall of Napoleon. Now, we might need to start off with a little bit of rapping, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all let me know if y'all don't want me to rap tonight. If y'all aren't, uh, you know, if, if y'all aren't uh, feeling the war, you know, if y'all aren't rocking the warm water records y'all let me know y'all just say like don't rap richie we don't want you to rap tonight and i won't rap i will not rap at all if y'all tell me not to okay so we want to think about something here um that we've got uh the congress of vienna okay and then that meets in 1815 that is after the fall of napoleon okay and so with that napoleon surrenders how are we going to rebuild Europe? Okay, so they get to Vienna, Austria to try to reestablish order and try to undo the French Revolution as much as they can. And the, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, as the conservatives see it, these twin threats of liberalism and nationalism. Now, also one thing to kind of, uh, to kind of remind y'all of, um, if you type in, did Napoleon betray the French Revolution? Scroll down just a little bit. Let's see if we can get the rank up just a little bit, okay? Because you're going to find at some point, um, let's just actually, you know what? Richie. All right. If you search for Richie, um, or if you can, you want to Google search, did Napoleon betray the French Revolution? Tom Richie. Okay. You can search for that. And there we go. I've got a little uh, little thing about Napoleon and the French Revolution and what was the French Revolution about. And in order to know if Napoleon betrayed or undermined it, you're going to have to know what was the French Revolution about. What were these values of the French Revolution that are being upheld or undermined? So that is something that is available to you. But what we're getting to is the fall of Napoleon and this effort to put the balance of power back together, okay? So to rebalance Europe. And so then you've got the quadruple alliance that defeated Napoleon. Um, and so going from there though, that you know they, they don't want to punish France, okay? They don't wanna punish France. So France gets a seat at the table. This is very unlike the, the Paris Peace Conference, which leads to the Treaty of Versailles, where Germany is completely out, okay? Germany has no role in putting together the Treaty of Versailles, but, uh, you know, Metternich says that in order to maintain the balance of power, France must remain a great power. Like, there is no strong Europe without, uh, you know, without a strong France. And so with this, you know, Metternich is kind of this figure, this very... Uh, um, you know, predominant figure in early 19th century Europe, where he is a proponent of conservatism, which has two main things here, stability within states and stability between states, okay? And so when we're thinking about stability within states, um, upholding tradition, institutions, aristocracy, not having all of these reforms and all of that, okay? So basically stability within states, no revolutions, Stability between states, where you have this concert of Europe. Now, the concert of Europe, this is not the concerts that I go to back when concerts were legal, but, you know, the concert of Europe where everybody is playing together. There's no mosh pit at this concert, okay? That Metternich is, you know, bringing about the concert system. And if all the great powers work together in concert, then we will have a peaceful Europe that is upheld by this collective security agreement. And so with that, understand what's going on here is the German Confederation is created here, uh, which uh, the Holy Roman Empire is gone. Napoleon abolished it. It's not coming back. So there's this 39 state German Confederation. Now, France is, uh, you know, restored to the 1791-1792 borders. Um, so they are basically all of the Napoleonic gains are done away with. Um, and then we see here that Russia gains territory from uh, from what had been uh, from what had been Poland. And then we see here that the German Confederation, this associated with association of states. Now, of course, one of the big questions in the 19th century, who's going to dominate this German Confederation? Prussia? 
or Austria. And so one thing we want to note here is 1815 to 1848 is known as the age of Metternich. Okay. So the age of Metternich, which is during this concert system, this is before the revolutions of 1848. Also, let's note that the Crimean War is something that, you know, gets in the way of the concert of Europe, kind of destroys it because it's the first time that the great powers are fighting each other. All right. And has it been requested that I'm not rap? Uh, I want to make sure I don't offend anybody if I just start rapping all of a sudden. I mean, I'm not a rapper, um, but at the same time, I don't want people to get offended. OK, so uh, so let me just uh, make a little note here. And, uh, you know, should I rap tonight? OK, so, uh, you know, yes, uh, you know, rap. OK, so, uh, you know, I'm I'm rocking with rap. OK, so I'm rocking with rap. OK, and, uh, you know, please don't. OK, so let's see what y'all have to say here on um, those of you in the crowd cast. OK, so please don't. Let's see what y'all are going to say there. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, the Metternich rap, of course, y'all can look up my SoundCloud. That's a favorite that people have. Uh, you know, I'm wondering here if uh, as Jocelyn uh, Martielli, has she heard the Metternich rap? I wonder. Uh, Dahomey Nine, Rocco, Popovic, and, uh, you know, we've got uh, Mia Lorraine. Um, so let's see here. We've got a few new followers here on uh, Instagram. Thank you, Megan, for all of the, uh, you know, all of the likes there, supporting me over there. And so uh, so with that, uh, Gwyneth, thank you so much. And we've got Eric Lewis, great son, great son and Jay Waz, JJ. Okay, lots of y'all. Rovid19. I wonder if by saying that I got uh, some things there. Okay, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, the Metternich rap, okay? What up, Europeans? It's the ladies' pick. Austrian Prince Clemens von Metternich, aristocracy savior. I'm the man of the hour. Gonna carefully restore Europe's balance of power. Eat nationalists for breakfast. Liberals for my dinner. Gotta be conservative if you wanna be a winner. I'm the coach man of Europe, so you better hold your horses because all the great powers are about to join forces. Napoleon thought he was too big for Elba, so we put him on a boat straight to St. Helena. Threaten European peace, so we set him adrift. Shake the French Revolution off like Taylor Swift. Come on, Tally Rand, take a seat at the table because Europe needs a France that is strong and stable. There's no need to punish France. I just want to keep order and restore the old 1791 borders. The liberals have ideas that they want to express, but I shut their mouths up when I censor the press. Stability between and within European states, it's the goal of this order that I'm trying to create. So call, join me in Vienna where a Congress is in session. To Wait, Together we can stop. Yeah. So join me in Vienna where the Congress is in session. Together we can stop the revolution from progressing. This conservative order, no, it ain't going to fall because I build coalitions like Trump builds walls. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so with that, okay. And who is this Queen Candace everybody's talking about here? Um, so yes, that is, uh, that is correct there, Jackie. I think that is correct. Uh, if they can understand that, uh, I mean, if they understand what I just said. Okay. So with that, there was actually a graduate student taking a, you know, diplomatic history in Austria or something like that. Um, so as far as that uh, goes, okay, the YouTube chat, they are liking um, the uh, the fire that is being spit there. <laughs> All right. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, let's, uh, Let's keep it. Uh, let's keep it G-rated, y'all. And we've got a super chat. Okay, I love you too, Gussie. All right, uh, buy my own super chat. How would I buy my own super chat? That seems like what? Okay, so with that, yeah, Andreas, let's uh, let's keep it. Uh, let's keep it PG in here. All right. So uh, so with this, um, let's just uh, go ahead and go to the next thing. So y'all were asking about the revolutions of 1848. Okay, and we've got a few more in the art of euro remember that's going to be at 10 p.m eastern we're going to be um having an art review okay so let's go ahead now and get into the revolutions of 1848 okay so going into the revolutions of 1848 um now i'm going to just let you remind y'all that i've got a five-part lecture on my youtube channel okay so with that I'm going to give you kind of an introduction here. So the revolutions of 18 uh, of 1848, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is something, uh, you know, something tonight. 
Uh, you know, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, let's just look at the brass tax, kind of what will be in the first part of the video. So Europe in 1848, we see this, uh, we see that there is a challenge to the concert of Europe and the concert is just getting started, ladies and gentlemen. So with the revolutions of 1848, there are a few things here that we're going to make specific note of. Okay. So first of all, several European nations were swept by a series of simultaneous revolutions. How about that alliteration there, huh? I mean, I feel like I'm doing a good job there. Swept by a series of simultaneous revolutions. I worked hard on that. I worked hard on that. Castione says it's okay to brag if you got something to brag about. Uh, civic humanism, y'all. Um, so with that, then we go on to the next thing here, okay, where these revolutions generally failed and conservatives regained power, okay? Uh, you know, so they generally failed, unlike Anna Collins, 150, who's going to uh, pass tomorrow, okay? She's not going to fail. Um, JP Awesome Face is not going to fail tomorrow. But these revolutionaries generally fail and conservatives regain power. And then from there, Britain and Russia did not experience a revolution of 1848. And really for different reasons, okay? Um, it's because when we're thinking about this, Britain, they did a lot of reforming already. And then Russia is pretty much in a situation where, uh, you know, they're not as developed and things are, you know, the government tends to be pretty oppressive over there. So, uh, so with that, uh, you know, we've got, uh, you know, these three kind of general observations. And again, this is something, this is one of the two things that we would say is ending the, the age of Metternich, the concert of Europe, okay, um, where there's basically been peace for all this time. Now, the Crimean War is another thing that we'll note as far as bringing about the end of the concert of Europe, okay? So, uh, you know, so con the concert of Europe, okay? So the war wrecked the concert of Europe, which had kept the peace, okay? So the Crimean War is the first, uh, you know, is the first war between any of the great powers. And what happens here is the Ottoman Empire um, is basically is receding during the 19th century. The Ottoman Empire is on its last legs and Russia's like, I'm going to get some of that. Okay. Russia like moves in. And with that, uh, what we see is that France and Britain, they're like, oh, no, you don't. Okay. That's going to mess up the balance of power. So, Russia, you are not moving in where the Ottoman Empire is weak. We are going to fight you. Now, also, Sardinia joins in here. Uh, Piedmont, Sardinia, which is uh, that is where you've got Cavour. Okay. So, Cavour, you know, Bismarck's using Bismarck's like blood and iron, you know, the position of. Prussia and Germany at this hour will not be determined by its liberalism, but its power. Now, I'll do that one in a little bit, okay? Because I feel like uh, I feel like doing some more rapping if y'all aren't tired of that. I'm not a rapper. Okay, now with that, the Ottoman Empire, France, and Britain, you know, that basically Britain and France are there to, uh, you know, to assist with what's uh, with what's going on here, okay? And so, so with that, Russia ends up losing this war. Now, also another thing about the Crimean War, it's a modernizing war, okay? Because basically, this is a war that's like the second industrial revolution is just beginning, okay? The second industrial revolution is just beginning. And so you've got like this, uh, this very like, you know, like you've got cavalry charges and heavy artillery and, you know, right, you know, repeating rifles. You know, I mean, it's getting to where like the military technologies are so disjointed that it leads to reforms in the military, including where the British uh, Empire will start. Uh, the British Empire will stop allowing officers to buy commissions. Now, later on, if somebody wants to hear the charge of the light brigade, that is also, you know, I think a dramatic reading is always in order here. Um, but if we mention this tomorrow, maybe we'll hold off till breakfast with Richie. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to go to a faculty meeting at, I'm, I'm going to be in a faculty meeting at nine. So breakfast with Richie this year is not going to start until 10 a.m. Eastern, not 9 a.m. like usual. Okay. So sorry about that, but we're still going to have a good time. So as far as that goes, we need to think about the revolutionaries here. Now, first of all, understand that classical liberalism is, uh, you know, classical liberalism is something that it's hard for Americans to wrap their brain around. But remember that we're not talking about 
about liberalism in the United States. Although there may be some things in common from a social perspective, um, from an economic perspective, remember that liberals, they generally want as little government as possible, okay? As little government as possible in all areas of life, you know? And then when the economy, you know, in terms of the economy, low taxes, low regulation, um, they want, uh, you know, representative government, but they want the government to protect property. Uh, you know, they don't necessarily want like universal suffrage. You know, some of them are kind of scared of that because you let the masses vote. The last thing the masses are concerned about is about the protection of property. And so they, they want, you uh, you know, civil liberties, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. So those are the liberals. Now, the nationalists, nationalists, you know, they want national unity based on a common language, culture, religion, and some sort of shared concept of history and who they are and their traditions. And so then we get to the radicals, okay, which uh, the Democrats and the socialists. Now, the Democrats, these are people who want democracy, okay, universal male suffrage, whereas the socialists, they want worker ownership of the means of production, guarantees of employment, a welfare state. Remember that although uh, some Americans, uh, you know, they basically use liberal and socialist interchangeably, remember that in the 19th century, liberals and socialists could not have been more different. Liberals are the heirs of the Enlightenment. They believe in the individual. Whereas socialists believe that individual interests go against the interest of the whole. And so what happens here is they are not really, you know, these revolutionaries are not really able to agree on a program. And so with that, you know, we want to uh, we want to note here that when we're thinking about like the French Revolution of 1848, um, I saw that people were talking about, uh, you know, Louis Napoleon in the, uh, you know, in the chat. And so basically what ends up happening now, y'all are welcome to uh, to look at the lecture for more in depth. But Louis Napoleon ends up becoming the president of the Second French Republic. And then we see after a few years, the apple does not fall far from the tree. And there is Napoleon and the third and the third French empire, okay? And so when we look at this, now the third French empire lasts until the Franco-Prussian War, okay? And that is where, uh, you know, Bismarck is going to, uh, you know, Bismarck is just gonna, you know, just, I, I, I can't even say what happens there. I mean, it's just, it's just a, you know, a bloodbath there. And so in 1848 in France, the French Revolution, 1848, Divided revolutions were unable, revolutionaries were unable to agree on a program. Conservatives and moderates feared the excesses of the radicals. Counter revolutionary conservatives regained power. And what we want to understand here, too, is when we're looking at the map of the revolutions of 1848, we want to understand that this uh, stability between states and helping each other or within states. Basically, Russia is not experiencing a revolution of 1848, so Russia has troops to send into Hungary, okay, whereas, you know, the Hungarians, they like to revolt, okay, the Hungarians, they like to revolt. And, you know, with that, uh, you know, they also revolted in the 1950s during, uh, you know, during the Soviet period, during the Cold War, and uh, that was put down. And so with this, you see, especially in Italy as well, that Austria sends troops into Italy, France sends troops into Italy at the request of the Pope. So, you know, the concert of Europe kind of, you know, kind of works here. But at the same time, you know, Europe is not going to quite go back to what they had there during Metternich's conservative order during this time. And so from there, let's see what else we've uh, what else we've got here. OK, so we had uh, we had that we are finished answering that. Um, so with that, um, we are going to Caitlin. Remember, I am going to be doing an art review later on. Um, so that is going to be something that, uh, you know, some of you can buy in. Some of you, your teachers, you know, your some of your teachers may have told you that they got a ticket for their class. Um, but that's I'm going to be deferring all of the art uh, later on. OK, so that's going to be at the art review later and that's exactly what I'm going to be doing in the art review is going um, chronologically through the different periods and describing, you know, how is it that these art movements movements fit in? OK. And so as far as that goes, uh, GC, uh, there is nothing that I can guarantee will show up on the exam. I mean, no cap. OK, I have been 
through years where my students finish the exam and they say, I, you know, the French Revolution wasn't even on the exam anywhere. And so there will be some things here that, you know, it's like you're just wondering, you know, is this guaranteed to show up? Never in, in any single exam administration. And that's why when people ask me, what do you think is most likely to be on the exam? I, I say you're only taking the exam once. So most likely doesn't matter because if you study what's most likely, then you are going to be looking at something like that. Now, the only um, Liam, there's no need to be scared. OK, but as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, one thing I would say is John Paul II, I think might be a useful pope to memorize due to his role in the fall of communism. John Paul II was from Poland. And when the Catholic Church, you know, named a Polish uh, pope, they were, you know, expressing support for what he had done to undermine communism um, in Poland. Now, note that doesn't mean that John Paul II or the Catholic Church endorsed capitalism or anything like that. But John Paul II uh, did do quite a bit during the Cold War to undermine communism. Y'all stay hydrated. Y'all stay hydrated. Okay. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, and I know that Alicia is not disappointed because I've already done an overview of the age of Metternich. OK, and so with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me say hi to the folks that are on, uh, you know, that are on YouTube real quick. Um, let's see what we've uh, what we've got here. It looks like this this chat has no, no, surely that chat has not. Uh, OK, Russian Revolution. We see some people here um, that uh, Prisha wants to hear about the Russian Revolution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Google Drive and I'm going to find some notes that I've made about the Russian Revolution and I'm going to share those in the chats. OK, so I haven't really put these up on my website, but uh, let's see. So Russian Revolution. Okay, so Russian Revolution notes. Let's go ahead and pull that up and I'm going to share those. Now, not everybody may see those uh, at the same time. So just uh, apologies uh, to that. Um, you know, so they're not going to want everybody to see them at once, but just go ahead and keep the link and I'll be, uh, you know, putting these up now. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's see if we've got any uh, new followers on Instagram. Um, let's see, Sam, Samya. Ka Samya Kasal Gia. All right. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, says Samyak, uh, maybe. Okay. So, Charlotte, thank you so much for your support. Um, Anna Hun and Doodle Paws. Okay. And not, let's not forget Renit Patel, 15. Um, Joy Epperson and Carson um, Ciminelli and Kulkowski. Thank you all so much for your support there. And so with this, ladies and gentlemen, let me go ahead and share the link to uh, to what I've got here on the Russian Revolution. I'm going to put this in the chats. All right. So we're going to go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, this is going to be a pog moment in the chat, ladies and gentlemen, um, because you're going to see this. Send you the Google Drive. Ramen Tuber wants the Google Drive. There you go. All right, so we've got here Bestie, SJ, my bestie over there, and Caitlin Davis, Poggers. All right, so we've got that, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll get to some isms in just a little bit. So with that, let's go ahead and, all right, we're going to, uh, we're going to open this up and get, uh, and get started. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and go here where I'm going to go to Google Drive there. And again, this is going to be something that it may not want y'all to access it but at all at once, but it's right here on the screen. So the Russian Revolution, when we're thinking about some context, we think about although Peter the Great, you know, did a lot to westernize Russia, the czars that came after him really did not. OK. And so with that, uh, you know, we see here that, you know, Russia by 1850 is still, uh, you know, is still behind on things. And so going from there, you know, while Central and Western Europe now are getting to be industrialized, urbanized, they are developing institutions of representative government. Russia is still only beginning to industrialize 
still heavily rural and they still have an autocracy, no legislature, anything like that. We've been over the revolutions of 1848. Now, one thing I'm sure that, uh, you know, Cheryl Lawrence, who just followed me on Instagram and liked a few photos there, um, that, uh, you know, Marxism and anarchism, this actually comes up in the course and exam description. Now, when we think about comparing things, we want to think about similarities and differences. So Marxist and anarchist, they're both socialist movements whose goal was to overthrow the state. So Marxists, they want to overthrow the state, the existing state, and replace it with a new centralized communist state. The anarchists are like, no, thank you. Like we're going to, uh, you know, we're just going to abolish the state and replace it with a system of voluntary cooperation. Now, while they both favored violence, Marxism, it's like there's going to be a large scale insurrection run by the masses. OK, and so with that, uh, then the anarchist isolated acts of terror orchestrated by small groups of revolutionaries. Now, the thing is, I think we've definitely seen over, uh, you know, over the past year, you know, how easy it can be to, you know, to scare people. I mean, it's it's just, you know, people um, can be, you know, can be driven to fear like very, very easily, uh, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like this, you know, everything is on fire around them. You know, it can just be the threat threat of something. So if there is, you know, anarchists, like they create these little terror cells and you just never know when the next, uh, you know, when the next uh, violence is going to strike, you know, y'all were born after 9-11, but imagine if there were like a 9-11 kind of event every year, people would be afraid to fly. And so with that, you know, the anarchist, you know, they've got a plan to basically, you know, overthrow everything by just these isolated acts of terror and making people, uh, you know, making people afraid on that uh, on that count. Now, they all opposed reformist liberalism. And so with this, Alexander II was a liberalizing czar. He was a reformer. Now, he emancipated the serfs. He supported industrialization. Uh, and began planning the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which would be built during his son's tenure. Um, and then he organized local governing councils, even came up with a plan for a state Duma. Now, that never came to fruition because he was assassinated. OK, and so with that, his son, Alexander III, he ex he represented continuity in the sense that, uh, you know, he continued to support modernization and industrialization. Um, but he, you know, he he was a, he represented change because he abandoned his father's program um, of liberalizing reforms from above. Thank you so much, so much. Uh, you know, we've got here, uh, you know, Mia Bloom, I think, has just uh, shown paid her respects to Harambe. Um, and I'm so, uh, you know, that's one of those things. Any student that's wanting to do well on an exam, like they really should uh, pay their respects to Harambe, um, you know, who gave his life so that you can have a chance of passing. So basically, no more liberalizing, though. OK, so and then we see like Nicholas II, Nicholas II, kind of like Louis the Sixteenth. He was just the wrong guy. OK, and so with this. He was just the wrong guy for the time. And, you know, as they say here in the South, bless his heart. Um, and so the so the Russo-Japanese War, remember that Japan was a westernizing country. OK, Japan decided they saw what was going on in China uh, with all the spheres of influence and all that. Japan's like, uh, -uh we don't want to get economically um exploited, I guess we'll just use the word exploited um, by the West. And, uh, you know, so we're going to westernize and modernize. And so the Russo-Japanese War represents the first victory of a non-Western power over a Western power. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, the Russian Revolution of 1905, there are actually three Russian revolutions uh, that uh, the first one is 1905 results in a constitutional monarchy. Y'all can read a little more of that. Now, Nicholas still had a veto over legislation. So how much, you know, an absolute veto. So how constitutional was this? Um, but as far as that goes, 1917, you've got the February Revolution and then you've got the October Revolution. OK, the February Revolution, the result is a constitutional republic, um, while the, uh, you know, while the October Revolution is 
communism. Okay, so the October Revolution uh, results in communism. And so uh, and so with that, I tell you what, Mia, you are just going crazy on the Instagram comments. This is so funny. All right. So with that, the October Revolution resulted in the communist takeover of the, uh, you know, of the Russian government. And so we see here that, uh, you know, we've got, uh, let's see here where um, we've got Sazimon Solars. Thank you for the recent follow. Marxism versus Leninism. So we also want to note that Lenin is departing a bit from Marxism. Now, Lenin agrees with Marx that history is defined by repeated class struggles, okay? And they both believe that the capitalist order will be overthrown by the working class in a violent revolution, okay? Establishing communism. Now, one thing, there are two ways you can look at people. One way you can look at people is that people are generally smart and they will generally be able to figure out their own interests. Another way of looking at people is that people are generally stupid and they need to be told what to think. OK, now Marx is in the first camp, you know, Marx in his scientific socialism. It's almost like he's got this down to a formula. He says that this revolution is going to happen naturally because the working class will independently establish its own class consciousness. Like, you know, there will be, you know, a worker just kind of like there and he's just like, hey, I think we're getting screwed. And then the worker next to him is like, I was just thinking the same thing. Did we just develop a sense of class consciousness? Yep. All right. And so with that, uh, you know, a vague stepbrothers reference for anybody who gets that. And so then Lenin, he says, no, look, like the working class, they're just a bunch of idiots. They're not going to develop their own sense of class consciousness. Somebody's got to educate them. Somebody's got to lead them. There needs to be a revolutionary vanguard, a group of professional revolutionaries um, that are, uh, you know, a group of professional revolutionaries that are going to help the working class develop a sense of class consciousness. And thank you, uh, let's see, uh, Caris M, Caris Ma Phelps, Caris Ma Phelps. All right, thank you so much for your support. And so a communist revolution, according to Marx, can only happen in a place where there had already been a bourgeois revolution. So it has to be a place where they've already have bourgeois institutions and also a place where, um, you know, you have, uh, you know, you've had an industrial revolution. Marx is thinking something like Britain or something like that. OK. And so with that, you know, Lenin's like, look, a communist revolution can happen anywhere. I bet you I can make it happen even in a place that is not industrialized or urbanized. So Russia, possibly you. OK. And that's what we're looking at here. And so with this, you know, it's like some Marxists, they say what happened in the Soviet Union was not Marxism. What they're saying isn't without merit. You know, Leninism is a variant of Marxism. Now, we'll note also that when Lenin takes control, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you what, the activity on the Instagram is so lit, I can't even keep up with it. Thank y'all so much. Christian uh, Herbert, thank you so much for your support. I know he's trying real hard to get noticed. Kay Anderson, 22. And so Lenin at first, he's like, let's do some war communism, y'all. And that's like basically where he's completely centralizing and collectivizing, um, you know, all industries, no private enterprise whatsoever, whatsoever. And so war communism, surprise, surprise, was a complete disaster. OK, and it calls for a change in course. Now, Lenin, remember, kind of like when Bismarck said, I don't like socialism, but I'm willing to adopt a few socialist policies um, in order to, uh, you know, in order to save what we uh, what we have here. OK. And so, uh, yeah. And Dylan is uh, Mia's friend. OK. So she, uh, you know, must be uh, must be great. Right. Um, so Dylan is Mia's friend. So she must be awesome. So with that, uh, we're going to uh, get into this, that Lenin, he's not a capitalist. OK. He's not a capitalist, um, but he is willing to indulge in a little bit of state capitalism. OK. And I know that uh, Zoe Mazzare is thinking about, uh, you know, buying into the art review tonight. And, uh, you know, basically the NEP, Lenin is going to allow what's called petty capitalism. Now, what is petty capitalism? You're looking at it, okay? If you came in here on YouTube 
you watched an ad. Okay. I got a little bit of ad revenue, but it's okay because the invisible hand, you know, I'm helping you, you're helping me. Um, you know, the Romulus uh, Euro app, you know, that's my little app, you know, now I'm not quitting my day job or anything like that. I still teach school, but you know, I've got uh, the art review coming up. Okay. That's going to be something. We've got a few more people in there. It's great to see that. And so with that, I'm indulging in petty capitalism right now. And so with that, you know, when you think about, you know, I've got like an app and a YouTube channel and a tutoring company, but you know, I'm just, I'm just a guy like trying to run a little, little side hustle here, you know, and Lennon's like, go ahead and run your little farm or your little like business or your little mom and pop restaurant, whatever. I'm not trying to get in the way of that, Lennon says. Um, so with this, that Lennon's going to allow like some petty capitalism and private enterprise to exist, okay? So I know that one day um, M. Malis is gonna be getting her hustle on and uh, you know, Lennon's got no problem with that, okay? And uh, let's see, Sarah E. Dake and uh, you know, Devin Barry, we got a lot, historian warrior. Wow, that is a cool name there. Uh, you know, and so with that, uh, you know, we've got those notes there. So a little bit on the Russian Revolution, ladies and gentlemen. So going with that, actually, okay, so if we're going to note here, if anybody's watching the Crowdcast later, I just answered the Russian Revolution. So go back a little bit because I didn't press the button when I answered it. Okay. Oh my goodness, the Glorious Revolution. I like that, okay? I like the Glorious Revolution um, because that that's just, that's a good revolution. I like it. So with that, let me just uh, go over. Did somebody say, uh, you know, rest in peace, uh, Harambe? All right, uh, Julia, I'm so sorry to make you uh, make you cry, but I guess, you know, really, I guess in Europe, they would call me a liberal. Um, so that's uh, that's something to keep in mind. I mean, if I, if I went to Europe, uh, you know, and they asked me where I weigh in, I would say that I'm a, you know, something of a liberal. And so, uh, so as far as that goes, Sophie, is that you? Okay. The YouTube chat looks like it is lit right now, y'all. Um, so enlightened absolutism, French revolution. Yep. Devin got that shout out, Angela. And so, uh, so, oh yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Friday. I want to do some, uh, Renaissance. I tell you, y'all are speaking my language there. Uh, you know what I'm thinking the glory. Okay. So the glorious revolution. Now I've got a whole series on this. Okay. But a lot of people are wanting to hear about the glorious revolution. The glorious revolution, like basically represents, uh, you know, Britain's rejection of absolutism. Okay, so Britain's rejection of absolutism. Um, and that is something, okay, so Devin, uh, yep, Devin getting that shout out, I'll tell you what. So with that, I've got a whole thing on that, but what we wanna understand is that there was an attempt to set up absolutism in England and Scotland, okay? So we'll go ahead and let's go ahead and go back to unit three here and let's see what we've got here, okay? So, uh, you know, and when we think about this, first of all, what is constitutionalism? Now we've got a constitution, okay? We've got a constitution. What does the constitution do? Now, a constitution by definition, limits government, okay? It sets boundaries for government that government cannot cross, okay? So with this, uh, when we're looking at Stuart absolutism, uh, you know, what we're seeing here is that, uh, you know, there is an attempt to have this absolute monarchy, okay? So there was one point, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a poem called The Divine Right of Kings. The only king by right divine is Ellen King and were she mine. I'd strive for liberty no more, but hug the glorious chains I wore. No, let's see, no tyrant vice dare interfere with, wait, no, no subject vice dare interfere with tyrant virtue. Good Lord, did I mess that up? I have done it so many times without messing up. I'm a little bit embarrassed. Uh, you know, so uh, so with that, where is, uh, where is that bit? Because I just, uh, yeah, so, uh, virtue interfere with, uh, yeah, anyway, um, this was something I, I just messed it up. So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for nothing, Edgar Allan Poe. All right. So, uh, so that's something that I thought that, yeah, I typically knew it. Um, so with this, we're going to go ahead and look at the stewards. Okay. So, uh, so with this, let's see, not, okay. So with this, let's go into that. Yeah. I got to look at that poem again. I tell you what, so the stewards, we want to understand, like when we're looking at the stewards, um, that this is, 
is uh, I'm thinking like, you know, minions and he'd be all like, Stuart, 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 you know? And so, uh, so Stuart absolutism, James the first and Charles the first. Now this goes J1, C1, C2, J2. It almost sounds like a Star Wars droid or something like that. Like J1, C1 and C2, J2. Um, but basically you think about it as a mirror image. The C's are on the inside, the J's are on the outside. Okay, so with that, James the first and Charles the first, they represent this period of Stuart absolutism. Now that leads to the English Civil War, okay? And then of course there is the interregnum or the protectorate. Um, so this is something that uh, you know we see here during the interregnum and then the restoration of Charles II and James II. Now, during this whole time, there is a conflict between the crown and parliament, okay? That basically, who has the authority to tax? How strictly is the state religion gonna be enforced and what even is the state religion? And where does sovereignty reside, okay? Um, is parliament, does parliament have any sovereignty at all? So when you think about the issues here, Protestantism, you know, usually it's Protestants versus Catholics, but also Protestants versus Protestants, Protestantism and Parliament. OK, and so what we see here is, uh, you know, James the first tries to rule as an absolutist, tries to rule by divine right. OK, and so with that, uh, you know, he has got, you know, basically he is enforcing the state religion like very, very strictly. Ripley, okay, so the Church of England and everybody's going to belong to the Church of England. Now, the King James Bible, that is King James's Bible, the authorized version. He's going to tell you what Bible to read. Now, then there are the Puritans and Separatists, okay, who believe these are Calvinists who believe that the Church of England is too Catholic. Now, they're both like basically they're they believe the same thing. They're just about different methods. OK, whereas the Puritans want to purify the Church of England, the separatists want to separate from the Church of England. Now, remember, I've got full lectures on all of this material, full lectures on all of this material available. And so Charles the first comes in with even more absolutism. And one of the big conflicts between Charles and Parliament is over ship money. Okay. Um, there was actually one of my students today in class. I was, I thought it was so funny, but basically we were listening uh, or not listening, but we were looking at, uh, you know, impression sunrise, uh, you know, and then so, uh, so one of my students, like looked at this painting and she said that painting is full of ships <laughs> i don't know anybody think that's funny uh you know if anybody thinks it's funny press f to pay respects uh whatever i mean it's just uh you know but she said that painting is full of ships and I was like, oh my goodness, that is so funny. I don't think she even meant to say that. Um, but when it comes down to it, I was getting them, like one thing that I really enjoy doing in class is like roasting this painting because this painting got roasted so much by the art community. Um, so as far as that uh, goes, the art community was, uh, you know, very much, uh, you know, just roasting the mess out of this. And so uh, shout out Grace 2021. Um, Grace M. Darling, you have got uh, you have got a shout out. OK, you have officially got a shout out. Um, so we did shout out Grace 2021. And so uh, so with that, uh, oh, my. Whoa, wait, whoa. Like Mia, did you know, like I broke my foot in December? I actually, you know, walked around in a boot for several weeks like I had a broken foot. So with that. I wonder, like, if, I mean, I've still got my, I've got my boot in the closet. Um, so, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, just, I, gosh, I mean, that is like, you know, we're broken foot buddies on top of everything else. Go make a five. Okay. That should be like a free five for breaking your foot. Cause I was like walking around in a boot for like two months and whoa, but I got to ride a scooter around school. So it was so awesome. Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, ship money. So what Charles did was that, uh, you know, Charles used a tax that already existed. See, Parliament is supposed to be able to approve taxes. But Charles is like, well, it's a tax that already exists. So all I have to do here is just change the way that it's applied. And Parliament's like, no, that's not the way it works, you know. Petition of right, yo, and they uh, they put this uh, they put this petition of right out there, and uh, you know, it's basically a petition. Charles saying, look, that we have rights. Parliament has rights. 
Now, Charles is like, okay, I accept your petition, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, call parliament for over a decade, okay? And, uh, you know, Emily, you asked for a shout out. You are getting a shout out. Thank you for your support on Instagram. Um, so that, as far as this uh, as far as this goes, ladies and gentlemen, Charles's period of personal rule, okay? Charles's period of personal rule. And so this is where he doesn't call parliament. Now, finally, in 1640, he has to call parliament and he calls the short parliament, which he calls and he doesn't like the way it's set up and they he tells them to go home and they go home then he calls the long parliament he tells them to go home and they're like nope and that parliament is long okay and that results in the english civil war okay which is going on for nearly a decade where you've got the cavaliers the supporters of the king from the roundheads okay so the cavaliers and the roundheads. All right. And so uh, so going from there, the Cavaliers and the roundheads, the supporters of the king, and then the supporters of the long parliament. Now, the roundheads weren't exclusively Puritan, but a lot of them were Puritan. And so when the roundheads, like basically Cromwell, ends up winning the war and Charles I is beheaded. And so with that, you have the protectorate where Charles, you know, where Oliver Cromwell is basically ruling as the Lord Protector, which is for all practical purposes, it's a military dictatorship um, with strict, we get the word puritanical from this, you know, like if your parents were like, you can go to prom, but you can go to prom, but hmm, why don't you come home at eight? As long as you're home at eight. And then you're like, mom, dad, you're so puritanical. Um, and so with that, that's what we're looking at there. Now, then what happens is parliament pretty much becomes a joke, you know, that you've got what's called pride's purge and every everybody that is not loyal to Cromwell is kicked out of parliament. Now, what you do see here is Cromwell's government issues Protestant toleration. Now, there are a lot of people that'll that'll talk about this in terms of they can compare it to the French Revolution. The protectorate is really the extreme part, which you could compare to the reign of terror. And they don't de-Christianize because the Puritans are Christians, but at the same time, um, what we've got here is uh, you know, the de-Catholicizing of the Anglican Church, you know, that basically the Puritans and the Separatists they wanted to de-Catholicize the Anglican Church. Um, so with that, uh, this is something Parker Roberson needed a shout out. All right, there you go, Parker. All right, so de-Catholicizing, not de-Christianizing, but making the Anglican Church look more like Calvinism, okay? Um, so with that, uh, you know, now you ever wonder, like when I was growing up, I was like, why is that song, The 12 Days of Christmas, and there's only one day at Christmas? And I didn't know, like there used to actually be 12 days. Like you would actually, like during, uh, you know, during Christmas, Christmas, there'd be 12 days between Christmas and Epiphany and basically of holidays and drinking and eating and more drinking and all of that doesn't sound like very puritanical. And so the Puritans, they wanted to get rid of Christmas, like, because really Christmas, check this out. Christmas literally means, and I bet you Nicholas Consul already knows this, but Christmas literally means Christ's mass. OK, so it is a Catholic holiday. It's like Christ's mass. And so Cromwell's parliament, they're like, you know, we want to get rid of the traditional celebrations of Christmas. They also wanted to ban cockfighting and other amusements and things like that. And so people thought this was lame and they're like, come on, let's uh, let's invite, you know, the monarchy was better than this. So when Cromwell dies, they restore the monarchy. OK, so this is the restoration and there's still going to be tension. Now, we don't have absolutism, but there's still going to be tension here um, between the king and the parliament. And so as far as that, hopefully Ella Jane 63 is enjoying herself over there. Uh, you know, what we've got here with the restoration, Charles II and James II. And so Charles II comes back from exile. He's known as the Merry Monarch. If you've ever seen the cute, like, you know, King Charles Spaniels, like those are like names for King Charles II. And basically, 
he issues a declaration of indulgence. He says that he will not enforce laws against Catholics and non-conforming Protestants. And this is a time when there's a Catholic resurgence on the continent of Europe. Now, the British like to do their own thing, as we've recently seen with Brexit. Y'all remember how people were like, oh my goodness, like Brexit's going to be such a like disaster for the UK. And now look at like the vaccinations in the UK versus like continental Europe. Um, and, you you know, that kind of tells you something. Everybody was like, oh my goodness, Brexit, it's just going to be like the worst um, for the UK. And then now they're like, you know, they're out vaccinating uh, pr pretty much about everybody. And so the thing is the British, you know, they just, they like to do things their own, their own way. And so with this though, Charles was found to be a little bit too tolerant. And so parliament pass, passes the test acts. Now the test acts, what these are, is these are acts that are, requiring every office holder to receive communion in the Anglican church. Every office holder has to receive communion in the Anglican church. And so we see here where James the first and Charles the first went to, you know, they were insisting on religious uniformity for the church of England, Protestant toleration during the interregnum. Now, Charles the second, You've got an established church with legal privileges. Now, if you want to serve in parliament or you want to be an officer in the military or something like that, then you have to be an Anglican, okay? You have to be an Anglican. But in private life, Christian toleration. If you don't have a position of public tr trust, then you are, you know, then Christian toleration. Okay. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, Amanda is a big Star Wars fan. That is great. Um, so with that, James II, now what James II does is he gives legal preference for Catholics in violation of the Test Acts. Okay. So as far as what goes, uh, what happens here is basically, you know, Charles II, he's always running out of money because he's got like all of these girlfriends, like these girlfriends and households to maintain. He's got like 14 kids with like eight different uh, wives. Actually, I've got a little rap about Charles II on the SoundCloud. I'm not going to do that one tonight, but you can go to SoundCloud. So basically, Louis and Charles, okay? So Louis um, the 14th and Charles uh, the second, they're buddies. And so they make the secret treaty of Dover. Now, this is something where they're going to double team the Dutch, okay? So you've got like basically during Louis the 14th's Dutch war, um, what you're going to see here is that Charles is going to get money from Louis in return for naval support, okay? And so with that, Charles also is supposed to convert to Catholicism. That's the other part of this. And so Charles on his deathbed, he converts to Catholicism, okay? And so with uh, with that, I'm so glad, uh, Christian uh, Cusano, that you are enjoying the live stream. And so he converts to Catholicism on his deathbed. And then James II is openly papist, okay? This is what the, uh, you know, what the English are calling somebody that's a Catholic. And so essentially here that, uh, you know, James II, uh, you know, was, you know, I've got a lot more in there, but basically James II was constantly getting into it with Parliament. He is, uh, you know, he is uh, getting rid of people in his administration that insist on being Anglican. And so, for example, he dismisses um, his Lord of the Treasury. His Lord of the Treasury basically tells him at some point, OK, stop trying to convert me. I'm an Anglican. And so then he uh, he dismisses him. Oh, my goodness, this water is so good when you're teaching all day. OK, so with that, you know, he, he says, James says, God has given me this dispensing power and I will maintain it. Basically, what James is saying here is he can dispense with any law that he wants. And Ella um, Lewinsky knows that this is not cool when a king tells Parliament that I am not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to follow the laws, OK, that I'm not going to follow the laws. And so he says, I'm not subject to the laws. Um, let's see, we've got uh, Ava, Ava E. Hall says, what's up? All right, so what's up, Ava? Um, so as far as that, uh, as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, 
um, what we've got there. And then so going from here that there are grievances against, uh, you know, against James. Cruel and unusual punishment. He's suspending laws like the Test Acts, which Parliament passed in order to protect Britain from, uh, you know, from Papists being in the government. And so with that, you know, when Charles has a boy, they orchestrate the Glorious Revolution. Now, William III, the Prince of Orange, who was Stadtholder of Holland, Zeeland, Utrecht, Gelderland, and over Isel, um, you know, William III, the Prince of Orange, the Stadtholder, is going to be invited in to be the king, okay? Now, he is married to Mary Stuart, who's actually like his first cousin. So we've got a cousin marriage here. Um, but at the same time, Mary, who is James II's father. Now, this is so funny because she like actually cooperates in the overthrowing of her father, you know? And so with that, William of Orange comes in. William and Mary are going to, uh, you know, are going to rule after the Glorious Revolution. And that basically solves this whole thing, okay? That basically on one hand, Parliament, they signed the English Bill of Rights, which Parliament is going to be in charge of making laws. Like they basically say that we are not going to interfere with Parliament making laws. And so then the other part of that is that William III of Orange is not a friend or a fan of Louis XIV. And so this also has an effect on the balance of power because this results in an Anglo-Dutch alliance against Louis XIV, which we'll see uh, during the War of the Spanish Succession. And so a big impact on the balance of power. And so with that, uh, we'll just go ahead and uh, stop there. We kind of got into the Glorious Revolution. Usually something I tackle during Breakfast with Richie, which is going to be tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. But we will, uh, you know, we've already tackled the Glorious Revolution. And good to see we've got some people in the art review, ladies and gentlemen, indulging me in my NEP, uh, you know, petty capitalism over here. Um, appreciate that. And so with that, oh, the water tastes so good, Ava. It tastes great. And so uh, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, going, uh, you know, going on from here. Remember, Romulus Euro is in the app store. OK, it's a two ninety nine app. I think it's, uh, you know, a great little handy trivia thing um, for y'all when you're uh, when you're doing your stuff for Euro when you're studying. All right. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and, um, you know, go ahead and let's see what we've got going out here. Um, shout out to Mr. Raskin, the best AP Euro teacher. OK, we got it. Uh, you know, and so with that, uh, let's see what we've got here. Bullionism. Now, bullionism, are we talking about mercantilism? Is that what we're uh, what we're getting into there? OK, so uh, so with that, I see Ella is not a fan, not a fan of Napoleon, who the two, 200th anniversary of his death was this week. Um, happy birthday, Tyler. OK, and so with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's see that we're, uh, you know, where we're going with uh, where we're going with that. And actually, let's see, we've got some folks, a lot of people are asking for the isms, okay? So a lot of people are asking for the isms. So what do y'all think? Y'all think we should go into the isms? I'm kind of feeling some isms. What about y'all? Um, so going from there, oh yes, joyous Laura, and I am joyous Laura, okay? I am joyous uh, don't cry, baby. You a thug, she says. OK. And so uh, you have uh, bought the app and I am joyous. OK. She bought Romulus Euro. That makes me so happy. So with this, let's go ahead and go into the 19th century isms. Now, I have, uh, you know, I have a video on that. And let me go ahead and, uh, you know, let me go ahead and shout out to anybody, any students in Virginia Beach um, for Mr. Goot's class, uh, you know, or any of those other classes, uh, you know, Miss Lawrence, Miss Davis, you know, all of these folks that are out there just doing such great things in Virginia Beach. So let's go ahead and go into the 19th century isms. OK, I think that is a wonderful idea here. And so going into that, let me go ahead and get the screen sharing here. All right. Did I mention that uh, that the app, uh, the Romulus Euro app is available on uh, Google Play and the App Store? All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's go. Uh, let's go. So 19th century isms. Now, first of all, remember, 
forget what you know about conservatism, liberalism, all of that kind of stuff. So Colton Pimble um, is forgetting what he knows about all of these isms, okay? And so he's just going to open his brain and listen, okay? Just like uh, XX Leanna XX, okay? So with that, conservatism, okay? What is it that conservatives like so much, okay? Now, this is something that appeals to the, you know, the aristocracy and the landed gentry, okay? So as far as that, oh yeah, Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Eccles, yeah, yeah, Brandon Eccles, yeah, he is, uh, yeah, great teacher. I've been in touch with that guy. You know, y'all are lucky to have him as a teacher. So shout out definitely to that guy. Tell him I said hello. So aristocracy in the landed gentry, tradition, institutions, privileges, these are things that they believe that these whole are the glue that holds society together. Mixes well with romanticism sometimes, um, doesn't really play well with liberalism, socialism, or nationalism. Now, in some cases, it could mix well with liberalism versus socialism, okay? Liberals, like liberals and conservatives aren't like, you know, aren't like great friends in the 19th century until the socialist starts up. And then all of a sudden, they're like, kind of like, you know, they're at a gathering and they pretend to start talking to each other and be busy so that socialism doesn't come up and try to talk to either one of them. And so with that, that uh, Edmund Burke and Clemens von Metternich, okay? So as far as that goes, Edmund Burke, uh, you know, and Clemens von Metternich. Um, so with that, uh, yes, we got Brighten Your Day 21 out there. Uh, you know, Edmund Burke and Metternich, and we think about Burke's reflection on the revolution in France. Edmund Burke was a critic of the French Revolution. And what he said is that, you know, what Edmund Burke said is that he, uh, you know, it's just like, like the French are trying to do too much too fast. You know, they, uh, you know, they're not going to be able to turn into Britain overnight. And the British have earned their liberties, you know, by tradition, not by just natural rights, but by tradition. But the Burke is kind of somebody who has some liberal sympathies, but at root, he is a conservative. Now, liberalism, this appeals to especially the bourgeoisie or the Borgiosi. You know, it's a written test, isn't it? And so as far as, uh, as far is that, uh, you know, C.C. Lee, I wonder how you are pronouncing this, okay? The bourgeoisie, the Borgiosi, whatever we call it. Now, liberalism, liberty, laissez-faire, reform, constitutions, choice, individualism, natural rights, equality, and progress, okay? These are things that 19th century liberals believe in. Don't go into this saying like, oh, liberals like change, okay? What kind of change, okay? So what kind of change do liberals like? That is something that is very, very important, okay? And Faith Heaton and Austin Gardner are paying their respects to Harambe as anybody who's about to take an AP exam should. That is uh, that is so um, good of y'all there. And also, ladies and gentlemen, why don't y'all get, why don't y'all hit Harambe movie up with a follow? There's actually this guy, Eric, that's a filmmaker. He's trying to make a movie about Harambe. Like I am not even making this up on Instagram. It's Harambe movie. I would love to see it right now. It's got 226 followers. I'd love to see that like double. Like what if we could get that up to like 500 followers or something like that? And there are actually like pictures of Harambe um, that like aren't seen anywhere else because the photographer that took the pictures of Harambe like shared them. And then there's this, if you need some relaxation, there's this little video of this little baby gorilla and he keeps like jumping in the straw and then he gets up and then he just like starts like, he'll jump in the straw again. It's so cute. Look at him. All right, now we got to get back to AP, okay? But uh, I'm going to put that on my story again because it's just so cute, okay? Harambe movie, and uh, there we go. So, mixes well with nationalism because nationalism is about, what nationalism is about, it's about self-determination. People tend to want to be governed uh, and in a political community with people like them. So, liberals would say, you should be able to be in a political community with whoever you want. Nationalists say, 
I want to be in a political community with people who share my language, people who share, uh, you know, my uh, my religion, my view of history and traditions and all of that. That's why when you think of it, Woodrow Wilson, who was, uh, you know, an early 20th century liberal, but definitely influenced by liberalism, that Woodrow Wilson wanted to, uh, you know, the self-determination of peoples, okay? When you think about this self-determination of peoples, that the Poles should have their nation because they want it. Uh, the, you know, the Czechs and the Slovaks, they're going to have to share, but the Romanians can have their own nation. Um, and so can, uh, you know, the Hungarians. And so with this, mixes well with nationalism, doesn't play well with conservatism or romanticism, definitely not socialism, okay? Because liberals, classical liberals are individualist, okay? And liberals, uh, even today, you know, liberalism has such a, you know, a rich history of civil liberties and toleration and all of these things here um, that don't go along with socialism, which is trying to subordinate the individual to what the group wants. Whereas liberals see, a harmony of interests, okay? And so with that, everybody has the same interests. Go to Adam Smith. Note that liberals are the heirs of the enlightenment, okay? Now, remember, conservatism versus socialism. And Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, plenty of other proponents here, wealth of nations. And of course, John Stuart Mill, I've got a video on him. He wrote a book called On Liberty. And so with this, the biggest difference between conservatives and liberals is they believe in rights, but conservatives believe that, uh, you know, you have rights because your rights are inherited, okay? Um, whereas liberals believe that your rights are natural and God-given. Conservatives see rights as part of a connection with the past liberals part of something that's god given all right harambe movie has got 50 new followers thank y'all so much i love this account and what they're trying to do they're really like trying to make a movie about harambe and showing like how gorillas are treated in captivity and so with this according to burke you know, in his criticisms of the French Revolution. And one of the biggest differences here in the Glorious Revolution, the French Revolution, is that the Glorious Revolution, it modified existing institutions, whereas the French Revolution destroyed and replaced existing institutions. So it's very important uh, that, uh, you know, that Marissa looks like over there, Marissa, if I'm not mistaken by some of the mutuals, you're over there in Jacksonville, Florida, one of my favorite places to learn AP. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so Marissa, great job there. I hope you do great tomorrow. So it destroyed existing institutions, created brand new institutions. And that is why Edmund Burke said the French Revolution was going to be a disaster, which for a time it kind of was. But then I think it all kind of worked out in the end. Romanticism. Now, here's the thing that liberals look forward and they think about like machines and money, whereas romantics look back and they're like, whoa, is that a flower? And is that a knight? Oh my goodness, that is so beautiful. Like that, look at that sunset over there. A liberal's like, when I'm done building factories, you won't be able to see the sunset, okay? So liberals and romantics definitely are not like BFFs, okay? And so with that, uh, you know, social classes here, uh, you know, artists, authors, and poets, okay? So when we're looking at this, artists, authors, and poets. And so, uh, you know, we've got here that uh, sounds a lot like... Uh, Jessica, um, to Jessica 2020, sup boys, I'm just living life, okay? And so uh, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, that that is, uh, she's just out there, yeah, just living life, boys. All right, B-O-I-S, rather, is it's kind of funny there. So with that, buzzwords here, beauty, okay? Um, beauty, nature, nostalgia, and the Enlightenment, no, okay? Now, I don't know how Millie McGee, he feels about the Enlightenment, but romantics did not like the Enlightenment at all, okay? Did not like the Enlightenment at all. Now, romantics, uh, Millie, you've got Psalm 113.3, um, that uh, the romantics did like the Bible. They did like religion and all of these other, uh, you know, all of these other things, you know, they thought religion was beautiful. Now, 
conservatism and nationalism because people fighting for their freedom it's it's beautiful and conservatism is trying to you know they're trying to stop the liberals from building those dirty ugly factories um and so then it doesn't play well with liberalism romantics and liberals like have some serious beef with each other and so william blake and eugene delacroix Del, Del, delacroix 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 it's a written test, okay, if y'all are taking it tomorrow at least. The other people have to type, um, or they get to type rather, right? So books like The Sorrows of Young Werther, Frankenstein, William Blake's poetry. William Blake is the one that like, you know, he writes about the dark satanic mills, uh, you know, and then Frankenstein, this story of Frankenstein thinking about like, you know, where Dr. Frankenstein is a personification of the Enlightenment. You know, where it's like, oh, science, I can create a man because we've got all this knowledge. And Mary Shelley's like, no, that didn't work out too well. You should just left that to God. OK. And so then the sorrows of young Werther, you know, this is where, of course, romanticism goes deeper than romantic love. But this whole idea of like, oh, my goodness, I just love her so much. And she's with another man and I just can't take it. I just want to die. And this is something that I think Napoleon like carried this book with him. Uh, you know, just it, it's a really beautiful book, but like at the end, like the main character, uh, you know, it's just, I don't think, yeah, it's basically in his, like, you know, in his writing, it's a first person kind of thing. So at the end of the book, you know, he's basically, it's evident that he's going to commit suicide because he can't have Charlotte. And this is one of those things that, you know, this is that romanticism, like being an emotional wreck is so beautiful. Somebody quote me on that. Uh, you know, so with that, that is romanticism. And so going from there, nationalism. OK, what is nationalism? Now, social classes. Now, no nationalism is about, uh, you know, class cooperation. OK, that basically what, you know, the German factory owner has more in common with the German factory worker and the German farmer than he does with the French factory owner. Um, and so people need to get together and put together a nation, okay, that this tra nationality transcends class, okay, and words like spirit, you know, the Volksgeist, you know, the spirit of the people, freedom, independence okay especially independence from foreign rule mixes well with liberalism in terms of self-determination um but then also mixes with romanticism because nationalist ideals are seen as beautiful you know when you think about that painting of liberty leading the people you know it's such a beautiful thing with this topless woman waving the flag and people of all social classes following her for the sake of france and that is both nationalistic and beautiful. Now, conservatives and socialists, not so much, because remember, uh, you know, socialists, especially those of the Marxist school, they tend to emphasize class conflict. Now, proponents, Mazzini in Italy and Hegel, a German philosopher, is it Hegel? Hegel, I, you know, it's a written test. So Mazzini wrote The Duties of Man. Now, another thing that we'll note here when we were talking about the printing press. Now, remember, you can go to marcolearning.com slash AP Euro. OK, so we go to marcolearning.com slash AP Euro. You can download a study guide here, a free study guide about the printing press. And so one of the things that we see about the printing press, not only was the printing press instrumental in uh, you know, in bringing about like in spreading Renaissance humanism to the north, the north of Europe, but also instrumental in the Protestant Reformation and the scientific revolution. It is an instrument of mass communication that is making it easier for ideas to get out there the same way the electric telegraph and the Internet and video communication are going to do later. Now, one thing to note, too, is that the printing press results in the popularization of the vernacular vernacular languages. And one thing that we see at the beginning of, uh, you know, the printing press, you start to see the dawn of national cultures. And to kind of think about what is the significance of these national cultures, uh, there is a wider availability of 
printed books that is increasing the demand for text written in vernacular languages um, that were spoken in their region. So basically, you know how we read Shakespeare here. You know, we read things like Shakespeare. You've probably read some of William Blake's poetry, or you will at some point. Uh, Mark Twain, you know, the great American author that we, you know, have a subject called English. You know, we are reading English literature. Whereas if you go to Italy, if you were an Italian student, you would be reading, uh, you would be reading things like, uh, you know, Petrarch and um, Boccaccio and Dante, because that's their national culture. So we see that there is a, there is a relationship between the printing press and national cultures. Now, speaking of this, ladies and gentlemen, this is from Marco Learning. You can go to marcolearning.com slash AP Euro. Now you can also go to youtube.com slash Marco Learning. Um, now at the, on their YouTube channel, I'm going to be there at 930. I'm going to be cutting this off and I'm going to be joining John on Marco Learning's channel. Now, if y'all haven't subscribed to my channel yet, y'all better do that. If you haven't subscribed yet, I know a lot of y'all are subscribed, but if you haven't subscribed to my channel, um, get over there and do that. I want to see a subscriber bump like now. Um, and so uh, so with that, Marco Learning is at 16.3. Let's see if we can get them to 16.5 or even 16.6. You know, between those of you who are in the YouTube and in the Crowdcast, we've got 700 in the YouTube right now we've got 400 in the crowdcast surely we can uh, we can go to marco learning's youtube channel and turn out uh, a few more followers there cuz that's where i'm going to be at 9:30 so y'all want to make sure that y'all uh, you know y'all know that's uh, that's coming up so uh, so with that i'm going to go ahead and put a link there to marco learning's channel so that y'all can go over there and uh, you know and subscribe to that channel so with that let's see what other questions that we've uh, that we've got here um, now, as far as that goes, the changes in familial structure over time. Now, one thing that I'll note is that in Europe, there has always been a preference for, like in modern Europe, for the nuclear family, okay? So when we're thinking about like the nuclear family, uh, you know, this is something, uh, this is something here that is, uh, you know, that when you think about, Asian cultures, you know, there are some Asian cultures where the parents, you know, if you're thinking about like China or India or Pakistan, um, where it is common for multiple generations to live under a roof, you know, it's like, I mean, in Pakistani culture, for example, it's like, you know, the parents don't end up really living alone in most cases. It, when all the kids are married, uh, the parents typically will move in with one of the kids, you know, it's one of those things where in Western cultures, cultures, we tend to, uh, you know, you tend to like only have like two generations living under one roof together. Together. Now, um, at the same time, there are periods where age, you know, marriage ages are changing. Of course, um, you know, there is a rise in like in the 18th century, there is a rise in illegitimate births, but the birth rate is kind of offset by people are getting married a little later. Now, unless you're trying to make a six on this exam, I would not think that the family structure stuff is going, I mean, it's like there may be a couple questions, but to me, it's like, it's so boring um, that I just don't see a point in spending a lot of time on that. Um, and that's something that I tend to, uh, you know, tend to think about in those, uh, you know, in those terms. Um, so going from there, ladies and gentlemen, now people want to know about Mussolini's Italy and what he did. OK, so let's see. Um, let me go ahead. And um, if you all like these, let me know if you all uh, let me know if you all like these. Uh, these uh, note sheets that I've got on Google Drive, these tutoring notes, because I would be glad to do uh, to do some more of those. OK, so I'm actually going to share these right now. And let's see. All right. So we want to change this to anyone with the link and we're going to go ahead and copy that. And we will say here, these are my totalitarianism notes. OK, so uh, so with that, we've got uh, we've got this here, totalitarianism notes. And uh, let's see what we'll uh, what we'll do from there. OK, so we've got these notes here and good to see people joining the art review. I'm going to go ahead and uh, totalitarianism. 
Okay, so totalitarianism notes. Did I just get a super chat? And I think I just, well, I don't know. The, the chat's going so fast. I don't even know who did that super chat. I just saw somebody put in a super chat and I'm very, very appreciative, but the chat is going so fast. So whoever that was, thank you so much. I love super chats. Okay, helping me out with that uh, petty capitalism. You down with NEP? Yeah, you know me. All right, so with this, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Mussolini. Okay, so as far as that goes, somebody was asking, can I please talk Talk about Mussolini's Italy and what he did. Okay, so as far as that goes, let me go ahead and just uh, show you these notes that I shared in the chat um, on totalitarianism. Okay, which uh, starts off with Stalinism. Now, Stalinism, uh, you know, Stalin in the Russian Revolution is sometimes compared with Napoleon. Okay, there's that question: Did Stalin, uh, you know, did Stalin? undermine the French Revolution or did Stalin, uh, you know, I mean, the Russian Revolution or did Stalin complete it? Now, I will hold off on Napoleon and the French Revolution until tomorrow, okay? And so we'll get the Napoleon song and all of that kind of stuff tomorrow. Um, so with that, you know, the idea of socialism in one country, okay? Stalin is saying that I'm not going to try to actively support worldwide communist revolutions. Instead, I'm going to try to strengthen communism here at home. Rapid industrialization with his five-year plans, which are very successful at first, but the level of success declines later collectivization of agriculture, okay? That's where basically Stalin is trying to get everybody on the collective farms. And the kulaks, these were landowning peasants. This is a word that means tight-fisted. Stalin is trying to paint these landowning peasants as greedy and against the interest of society because they won't give up what is theirs. Remember, uh, you know, when people don't want you to be free, they shame you and they call you, you know, selfish. And then, you know, what Stalin does next is he just starves them. And there are millions of people that, uh, that die because of this. And so going from that, um, you know, looking, uh, you know, looking here, um, we see that uh, Stalin is, uh, you know, this. So, so Stalin basically intentionally starves these peasants, relocates others, sends others to the labor camp, the cult of personality and political repression. Now, note when a historian uses the term totalitarianism, and I'm a fan of this term, okay? So when somebody uses the term totalitarianism, what they're saying here is that they are saying that Nazi Germany and, fa and Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union had more in common than not because Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, you know, they are both opposing liberal democracy. They are both promoting unity through some kind of hatred, governing through a single party elite, the cult of the leader and totalitarianism. And so with this, although we talk about like, you know, communists, which I, you know, left wing communists, which I call left wing socialism and fascist and Nazis, which I refer to as right wing socialism. At the end of the day, they've got more in common than not. Now, one thing that we're going to note here is that right wing socialism, you know, it's like when we look at fascist and Nazis, you know, the National Socialist German Workers Party, they tend to support some kind of social hierarchy where left wing is in opposition to social hierarchy. Um, you know, you can definitely see that in, you know, as kind of a microcosm uh, in our, you know, in our political system where somebody who is a little bit more like center right, they say that, you know, not everybody's never going to be equal, you know, in terms of their status. They can be equal in rights, but they're not going to be equal in status. Whereas somebody who's more left wing is going to say, we want people to be equal in every way possible. Um, you know, so the other thing here is fascism is inherently nationalist. Okay. And that's one thing, whereas Bolshevism is internationalist and promotes class hatred in order, you know, hatred of, uh, you know, just groups of people who are seen um, to be uh, against the interests of the people, um, then fascists will get into, you know, things like master race ideologies and the enemy is outsiders and stuff like that. So with that, when we're looking at Mussolini, you know, fascism, the elements of fascism are, first of all, a corporatist economy. Now, 
private corporations continue in fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, private corporations continue to own the means of production, but they are expected to produce in the service of the state. Okay. So there is also, as I said, an aggressive nationalism um, that the nation is the fundamental unit of organization, um, you know, instead of like the mass of the people, you know, and the workers and whatnot. But the nation is the fundamental unit of organization. Class cooperation. Okay. So rather than see, this is what we're seeing, like, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, how does right wing socialism differ from left wing socialism? That here, uh, you know, you've got class cooperation. And so Mussolini is saying that everybody needs to cooperate with each other. So in favor of nationalist ideals to compete, you know, to basically cooperate, not compete, cooperate for the common good, competing, that's liberalism and social Darwinism and stuff like that. So the rejection of liberalism, fascism rejects individualism as an organizing principle of society. Now, also, you know, fascists, they promise the revival of national greatness. You know, Mussolini, you know, basically the whole word fascism, it comes from the Roman word, from the Latin word fasces. Okay. The Romans had this bundle of sticks that they would tie together to symbolize the power of the state. And so what happens here is fascists, they, they, they believe in the power of the state, the bundle of sticks, not the individual sticks that are free to express themselves. Militarism, an aggressive militarism, which, uh, you know, Mussolini went into North Africa and uh, invaded Ethiopia. And then like Stalin and like Hitler, you know, Mussolini's cult of the leader, Mussolini as Il Duce. Okay. So with that, Let's see, I've got uh, got some things, uh, some things there. All right. And so a few things like if we're looking at, uh, you know, if we're looking at the seven years war uh, now, you know, I've got a video on the 30 years war. I'm going to leave you to that right now. I think it'd be a good idea to see an organized presentation of the 30 years war. The seven years war, all you really need to know about the seven years war is it was a colonial war. It was a global balance of power war and France lost their colonies. OK, that basically the seven years war helped to, uh, you know, tilt the balance of power toward Britain. OK, and it was because they're fighting in, you know, basically global theaters a lot of this in North America. You don't really have to know about what happened in the Seven Years' War in Europe, you know, which uh, even though Frederick the Great um, did some cool military exploits, you don't have to know them. Thank you so much, uh, Casey Jones and uh, Miss Hoyd for all of your support on Instagram. Y'all are doing a great job over there. Hopefully y'all, uh, you know, get into, uh, y'all do well in your exam tomorrow. Now, the view on, views on women changing over time, okay? Now note here, let's make sure that we're not saying that women before World War II, women were always just cooking and cleaning. No, okay? So first of all, let's talk about how men's work and women's work is divided in agricultural societies, okay? So think about Northern Renaissance, okay? Northern Renaissance art. Now, that's another thing. If you go to, uh, you know, marcolearning.com slash uh, AP Euro, you'll see that I've made a, uh, you know, I've made a guide on uh, the Northern Renaissance. And one of the things that you see in this Northern Renaissance study guide is that you'll see Peter Bruegel and his painting, The Harvesters. OK, and what you see here is men and women are doing slightly different work. You know, men are, you know, they're out there reaping and women are kind of gathering. Um, this requires more upper body strength, but men and women are out there working in the fields. OK, so basically before the Industrial Revolution, you know, work is happening very close to home. And so when it comes down to it, this is not, you know, like where the man is going out somewhere to work and the woman is just, uh, you know, cleaning the house and making babies or whatever. Um, and so with that, you know, you want to understand this. And now when the industrial revolution happens, a lot of women work in these factories, you know, women and children, uh, you know, their fingers are more nimble and they're able to um, get these factory jobs. So women are working during the industrial revolution, not necessarily the, uh, you know, the most, uh, you know, the most desirable job in the world, but they are working. 
Um, now, women, you know, during the Enlightenment, you've got a couple of perspectives on women in the Enlightenment. Now, you've got this guy, Condorcet, who is, uh, you know, who comes up in the side column in your course and exam description. Um, you know, Condorcet, uh, you know, is someone who was an Enlightenment philosopher, and he believed in women's equality, okay? So he believed in equal rights for women. Now, remember that Rousseau, okay, Rousseau uh, is not... Um, uh, you know, a feminist favorite. Okay. So when we're thinking about Rousseau, um, you know, Rousseau is definitely not a feminist favorite. Um, and Rousseau, he wrote this book, Emile. Okay. And so with this, uh, you know, this, this work, Emile or on education, he's talking about a separate education for men and women. And he's writing about how in his view, a woman is basically, she exists in order to please a man. And that's why women exist according to Rousseau. And so this is something now we're going to be talking about art later on, but we'll get into like Jacques Louis David and how some of his neoclassical work really echoes some of of Rousseau's philosophy. And so that's something that we see like Condorcet versus Rousseau. What have we done for Marco Learning's channel? They were at 16.3. Where are they now? Still at 16.3. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, let's get uh, get that going because I'm going to be moving to that channel um, very soon. Okay. Or I may just, uh, just stop broadcasting if we're not going to get some more uh, subscribers for them. So let's see. I might have to, you know, go on strike or something, even though the Napoleonic Code banned that sort of thing. So with that, now also we want to note uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, okay? So Mary Wollstonecraft, um, and I've got a video series on women and the French Revolution. So Mary Wollstonecraft wrote first a vindication of the rights of man, defending the French Revolution and liberalism. And then she writes a vindication of the rights of woman. Okay. And so this is really like the first like book length treatment of uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. Note they're calling her a, uh, you know, a proto feminist. This is kind of like it sort of predates, uh, you know, modern feminism, but she is one of the first uh, women to like write a work of feminist philosophy. Now, first wave feminism is about getting the right to vote, okay? So you want to remember, another person to remember is Emmeline Pankhurst, okay? Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, actually E-M-M-E, -M -M -E, not E-M-M-A, but Emmeline Pankhurst, she was a suffrage activist, okay? So she was, uh, you know, a suffrage activist, and this was a time when, you know, women were, you know, suffrage activists were being like, you know, put put in jail, and when they were in jail, they'd go on hunger strikes, and then they would, uh, you know, then they would be tube fed. I mean, this was really like, uh, you know, some awful stuff here. But first wave feminism is about getting the right to vote, okay? And then there is Pankhurst in her prison clothes for advocating for suffrage. She is uh, spending some time here in prison. And so what happens here, remember World War I, um, you know, women's suffrage, timeline. Okay. So women's suffrage timeline. Okay. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, if we look at a timeline, let's see, uh, timeline of women's suffrage. Note that, you know, total war, when we talk about uh, World War I, total war. Okay. And so before World War I, there was a uh, very little like, you know, equal suffrage for women. But what happens here now, you see it is in some states in the United States, uh, in Australia, New Zealand, and in Norway, um, it looks like here, but it's not, uh, it's not something Norway and looks like perhaps uh, Finland, um, but it's not very widespread. Now, remember total war, there are two things about total war that first of all, total war calls on everybody, even your own civilians to contribute to the war effort. So, you know, women are working in munitions factories and stepping up and doing other things to help the war effort. Now, also the other side of total war is you're willing to target enemy civilians. Okay. So that's the other side of total war, like an uglier side here. Um, but with this, what we're going to see is there is a lot that happens. Notice here that after, you know, during and after World War, uh, you know, World War One, we're seeing a lot more, uh, you know, just a very rapid, uh, you know, progress 
of uh, women's suffrage, okay, during the 1920s. And so that's something that you're going to see as a result of that. But then it's like, well, women get the right to vote, but it's not opening them up to the professions, to professional and professional employment. You know, it's not opening up medicine and law and university professorships and giving women economic and social equality. This is where you want to get into Simone de Beauvoir. OK, Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote a book titled the second sex. Okay. So she wrote this book in 1949, the second sex. Now she's coming from an existential perspective, whereas Mary Wollstonecraft is coming from a liberal perspective and explaining why women should have rights uh, based on liberal theory. The second sex is from existential theory. And so she writes about how woman is seen as other, you know, that a woman has never been seen completely as a a human being. Okay. And so that, uh, you know, that basically the default human being is male and that women are, uh, you know, are other, you know, the second sex. Okay. And then, uh, you know, she is actually the second sex is if we look at the index of prohibited books, the Catholic church's index of prohibited books, uh, that Simone de Beauvoir is actually the last author added to, okay? Like Descartes, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a who's who of European history. Of course, John Calvin uh, gets, uh, you know, John Calvin gets put on there. Um, and so we see here Voltaire, you know, you see Dennis Diderot. Um, then we've got plenty of people here, but uh, then now Jean-Paul Sartre, who was another existentialist, who was actually Simone de Beauvoir's kind of quasi life partner, if you want to call it that. But Simone de Beauvoir, Beauvoir, she was the last author to be put onto the Catholic Church's index of prohibited books. And before it was, uh, you know, before the index of prohibited books was done away with um, in, uh, you know, in the 1960s, about the same time as Vatican II. And so with that, uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's think about, uh, you know, are the past few streams? Yeah, the, the past few streams are on the YouTube channel. OK, the past few streams are on the YouTube channel. So that is, uh, you know, that's something that y'all want to make sure um, to uh, to look at as well. Now, if we got uh, if we got Marco learning any more, uh, any more subscribers, I sure I certainly uh I certainly hope so. Um, let's see where they are now. 16.3. Are y'all about to make me have 16.4? Okay, we got we got them somewhere, but let's see if we can get this up to 16.5. Uh, you know, I just don't see, you know, why I want to go live, uh, you know, on a channel with less than 16.5 subscribers. So am I gonna take a breather from 9 30 to 10 before my art review? Uh, or our art review, because uh, you know, some of my friends there are waiting for me, like 19 of my closest friends friends here. Chloe's going to be there, David and Jay and Eddie and Hank. Uh, you know, thank y'all so much for uh, y'all are already lighting up the chat there. Um, so with that, am I going to take a break or am I going to go to Marco Learning's channel and we're going to do about a half hour there? OK, so let's see what we're uh, what we're going to do here. Um, let's see if we can get to 16.5 or even beyond that. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, did we, you know what? I feel like the, uh, let's see. Um, let's see what I've got here. Okay. So uh, let's see. Scratch. Try, let me, let me see what I've got here. I'm seeing if I can find my Bismarck uh, wrap um, and see what, uh, what we've got here. Master. Let's see the scratch track Bismarck wrap. I'm looking for the instrumental. Um, let me see here. Okay, I think actually. Okay, there we go. Do y'all want to hear the Bismarck rap? I don't want to offend anybody. So y'all, once again, y'all let me know. Y'all like, hey, we've heard enough of that Warm Water Records. Remember, you can hear the raps. They're all on my SoundCloud. Um, but let's see. All right, let's see what you, what we want to do here, okay? So uh, so with that, y'all want to hear this or not? Y'all let me know in the chat whether this is something y'all want to hear. Um, I'm glad to do it. Wait, what? Oh, oops, that's the, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the SoundCloud version. All right, so with this, uh, with this, ladies and gentlemen, let's see what the chat is saying here. Okay, so y'all y'all want to hear the Bismarck rap, and I reserve the right to do this in the morning as well, okay? So I reserve the right to do it again 
in the morning. So, uh, so going from there, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's see what we're, uh, let's see what we're about to, uh, what we're about to do here. All right. So let's go ahead and. Okay. Warm water records. All right. Y'all ready for this? Blood and iron, more like blood and bars. All right. I'm the Iron Chancellor, and I feel an obligation unify the German states under Prussian domination, a conservative at heart. But I've got a little trick. It's the politics of power. Call it real politics. An alliance with the liberals because I'm industry emphatic and they're secular. They like my culture cough against the Catholics. They and the social Democrats because I'm going to put it bluntly. Whoa, that Germany will never be a socialist country. Actually, uh, that kind of ran out. Um, that's the that's the original instrumental that I had to uh, splice together here. Um, let me just uh, let me. Oh, my goodness. So instrumental. Let's see. Bismarck. OK, there it is. There it is. OK, so let me uh, let me just get back over there. Okay, so culture cop against the Catholics. Ban the social Democrats, because I'm gonna put it bluntly that Germany will never be a socialist country. I've got old age pensions and some accident insurance. If you're hurt at work, I got your back. You've got my reassurance. Call it state socialism. Now the liberals want to hate. But without the working classes, we can't unify the state. The position of Prussia in Germany at this hour will not be determined by its liberalism, but its power. I'm losing my voice. Aren't decided by speeches and majorities. It's blood and iron. I'll use war to spread authority with the Austrians as allies. We took Schleswig and Holstein, then declared war on Austria. The next step in my grand design, Prussia wanted seven weeks. Austria wasn't any match. Then it's time to provoke France for the M's dispatch. Multi-led and modern army armed with telegraphs and trains. France decisively defeated, gave up Alsace and Lorraine after unifying Germany. Then I really had some clout. Now it's 1890 and I, I'm out. All right, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, now remember that I am about to head over to Marco Learning's YouTube channel, um, and we are going to start some review there. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we did get up to 16.5. I am a happy camper. Also, I think John's going to show off Marco the dog. He usually does at these things. So if you want to see Marco the dog, join me over there. Um, and remember that I'll be back at 10 a.m., okay, for uh, 10 a.m. in the morning in the morning a.m. That was redundant, right? But I'll be back at 10 a.m. for Breakfast with Richie. We'll make sure to do a bit of Napoleon and all that, sing the Napoleon song. We'll do a couple other raps. I definitely want to talk about the Renaissance. Um, so that's something that I that I think is, uh, you know, is is an important thing. But we do have some folks uh, ready for the art review as well. Remember, it's not too late to buy in. That's a ten dollar ticket. And I'll be going through all of the major like art movements that are important for success on the AP Euro exam. So whether I see you on Marco Learning's channel in a couple minutes uh, at the art review or tomorrow morning, um, you know, y'all, uh, you know, y'all just uh, you know that it's always a pleasure and the class of Jay White, shout out to Miss Amy Franklin. Okay, and you want to see my shirt, please. This is AP Euro. This was a uh, Florida State University um, high school, or actually, I think this was Lawton Childs High School. Um, but the teacher went to uh, Florida State University High School. Um, thank you, Mr. Good. And uh, let's see, Caitlin, I love you too. Jacob, Tiffany, we've got uh, Miss Hoff. Yes, Miss Hoff, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. And Mrs. LaFrance. Okay, we're getting a shout out yep so uh so with that okay so uh nope sam i'm not gonna read that um thank you god bless you too and uh all right excellent excellent so uh we've got yes miss dunker i'm a big fan i'm a big fan okay so excellent excellent and let's see what we've uh what we've got here um let's see what we've got uh thank you um alegria and so that's, uh, we've got a lot of messages in YouTube being held for review. Mr. Hawkins and Mr. Uh, let's see, Mr. Hawkins and Mr. Wallace, thank you so much. 
Um, and so Angelina, thank you for the good vibes. And, uh, you know, this just is, uh, is great. Um, you know, just so glad to see all of the uh, nice things. So, um, uh, Mr. Kelly's class, Mr. Kelly's class, Mr. Kelly's class of 2021. All right, TJ, hope that was a good enough shout out for you. All right. Yep. Angelina, you got some clout now, don't you? All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all so much. And again, I will see y'all again um, very uh, shortly. You know, any, any of y'all see again, hopefully in the next like 12 hours or so. Um, so with that, we've got, uh, you know, Miss, Mrs. Rogers, uh, Mikulek, uh, Miss Snyder. Yes. Always a fan of Miss Snyder. So ladies and gentlemen, RIP Harambe. Let's see uh, how much did we get the Harambe movie up to 294 for the Harambe movie. Let's get them above 300. And with that, good luck, everyone. And uh, Miss uh, Miss Eisel, um, and then uh, Yas Victoria, Miss Ellery, R.I.P. Harambe once again. Um, so yeah, go to Marco Learning's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Marco Learning, or just type in Marco Learning on YouTube, and I'm going to be going live there in about seven or eight minutes. I'm going to rest my voice, get me a little warm water, so hopefully I'll be up to rapping tomorrow. All right, ladies and gentlemen, y'all have, uh, and shout out to Miss Kennedy, and always, I tell you, my life is a perpetual shout out to Miss Delbert's class, okay, so over there in New Orleans. So yeah, Marco Learning uh, YouTube. Y'all go ahead and join me. I'll be over there shortly.